Nick Bottom is a character in Shakespeare's A Midsummer Night's Dream who provides comic relief throughout the play. He is famously known for getting his head transformed into that of a donkey by the elusive Puck. Bottom and Puck are the only two characters who converse with and progress the three central stories in the whole play. Puck is first introduced in the fairies' story and creates the drama of the lover's story by messing up who loves whom, and places the donkey's head on Bottoms in his story. Similarly, Bottom is performing in a play in his story intending it to be presented in the lover's story, as well as interacting with Titania in the fairies' story. Overview Nick Bottom is a member of a theatrical troupe of Athens known as the Mechanicals, who perform a play within the play. They are foolish and clumsy men, all of whom are craftsmen in Athens. Bottom, the weaver, snout, the tinker, snug, the joiner, starveling, the tailor, flute, the bellows mender, and Peter Quince, the carpenter. The mechanicals, sometimes called the hempen homespunts, led by Peter Quince, are rehearsing a play, Pyramus and Thisbe in hopes of performing for Duke Theseus on his wedding day and perhaps even being awarded sixpence a day for life. Really a small reward for these six men. Bottom is given the lead role of Pyramus in the play, and something of a power struggle ensues between Bottom, a charismatic natural leader, and Quince, the somewhat nervous playwright attempting to direct his own play. He decides to have some fun with him, carrying out part of Oberon's orders in the process and when Bottom exits the stage, he transforms his head into a donkey's. When Bottom returns, unaware of his own transformation, his fellow actors run away from him with Quince screaming. We are haunted. Bottom believes they are playing a prank on him, proclaiming, This is to make an ass of me, to frighten me if they could. So he stays in the forest by himself and sings loudly to show them he is not afraid. The fairy queen Titania is awakened by Bottom's song. She has been enchanted by a love potion, which will cause her to fall in love with the first living thing that she sees when she wakes. Made from the juice of a rare flower, once hit by Cupid's arrow, that her husband, Oberon, king of the fairies, spread on her eyes in an act of jealous rage. During his enchantment over her, he utters, Wake when some vile thing is near. The first thing she sees when she wakes is the transformed bottom, and she immediately falls in love with him. She even commands her fairy minions to serve and wait upon him. Later, Oberon finally releases Titania from her enchantment. After being confronted with the reality that her romantic interlude with the transformed bottom was not just a dream, she is disgusted with the very image of him and also seems very suspicious of how these things came to pass. After Oberon instructs Puck to return Bottom's head to his human state, which Puck reluctantly does, the fairies leave him sleeping in the woods nearby the four Athenian lovers, Demetrius, Helena, Hermia and Lysander. He wakes up after the lovers leave. His first thought is that he has fallen asleep in the woods during rehearsal and has missed his cue. He quickly realizes he has had a most rare vision. He is amazed by the events of this dream, and soon begins to wonder if it was in fact a dream at all. He quickly decides that he will get Peter Quince to write a ballad of this dream, and that it shall be called Bottom's Dream, because it hath no bottom. Upon being reunited with his friends, he is not even able to utter what has happened and says, For if I tell you, I am no true Athenian. Theseus ends up choosing Pyramus and Thisbe as the performance for his amusement, now also the wedding day of the young Athenian lovers. The play is poorly written and poorly acted, though obviously performed with a great deal of passion. Bottom performs the famous Pyramus death scene in the play within the play, ironically one of the most comedic moments in the play. In performance, Bottom, like Horatio in Hamlet is the only major part that can't be doubled, i.e., that can't be played by an actor who also plays another character, since he is present in scenes involving nearly every character. Analysis Bottom's discussion of his dream is considered by Anne Thompson to have emulated two passages from Chaucer's The Book of the Duchess. 
Critics have commented on the profound religious implications of Bottom's speech on his awakening without the ass's head in Act 4 of A Midsummer Night's Dream. The eye of man hath not heard, the ear of man hath not seen, man's hand is not able to taste, his tongue to conceive, nor his heart to report. What my dream was, I will get Peter Quince to write a ballad of this dream. It shall be called Bottom's Dream, because it hath no bottom, and I will sing it in the latter end of a play, before the Duke, per adventure, to make it the more gracious. I shall sing it at her death. This speech seems to be a comically jumbled evocation of a passage from the New Testament's 1 Corinthians 2.9-10. The things which I have not seen, neither eare hath heard, neither came into man's heart, are, which God hath prepared for them that love him. But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit. For the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep of things of God. Stephen Dolliff also suggests that Bottom's humorous and foolish performance at the end of A Midsummer Night's Dream mimics a passage from the previous chapter of Corinthians. For seeing the world are by wisdom and knew not God in the wisdom of God, it pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. Seeing also that the Jews require a signa, and the Grecians sake after wisdom a. But we preach Christ crucified, unto the Jews, even a stumbling block, and unto the Grecians, foolishness. But unto them which are called, both of the Jews and Grecians, we preach Christ the power of God, and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men. This passage's description of the skeptical reception Christ was given by his Greek audience appears to be alluded to in Bottom's performance. Just as Christ's preaching is regarded as foolishness, Bottom's audience perceives his acting as completely without value, except for the humor they can find in the actor's hopelessly flawed rendering of their subject matter. Dolliff writes that this illusion is especially likely because, in both texts, the skeptical audience of the foolish material is composed of Greeks. As the spectators of Bottomael, Athesius, the Duke of Athens, and his court, scholarly debates, the origin of Bottom's farewell to Quince in Act I, Cini has become the topic of some disagreement among Shakespeare scholars. Parting with Quince, Bottom instructs his fellow actor to be at the next rehearsal, saying, Hold or cut bowstrings. The debate is centered on whether this phrase arose from military or civilian life. George Capel is the first to have offered an explanation of the origin of this phrase. He states that it is a proverbial saying and was born in the days of archery, when an archery contest was planned. Assurance of meeting was given in the words of that phrase. If an archer did not keep the promised meeting, then the other archers might cut his bowstring, that is, demolish him for an archer. From this particular usage, the phrase had an easy transition among the vulgar to that general application which Bottom makes of it. However, W.L. God's Hawk refutes this theory, stating that no subsequent scholars have been able to confirm Kappel's ideas. God's Hawk also states that it is unlikely that this was a common civilian phrase, as there are no other examples of this exact form of the phrase in the work of any author besides Shakespeare. God's Hawk further cites the work of George Stevens, who was able to find two vaguely parallel examples in 17th century drama. In George Chapman's The Ball, Scartier asks Lady Lucina, have you devices, to jeer the rest? Lucina answers, all the regiment of M, or I'll break my bowstrings. God's Hawk argues that the context implied by regiment is important as it implies that the breaking of bowstrings should be seen in terms of military rather than civilian archery. Stephen's other example is from Anthony Brewer's The Cove Tree Girl, a comedy. Feidler, strike, I strike you else, and cut your begging bowstrings. God's Hawk writes that the first strike means to play upon the fiddle. The second strike may again suggest a military context for the cutting of bowstrings. Though any reference to military archery is comic since the bow, in this case is the fiddler's bow, God's Hawk argues that, just as these examples indicate a military context, 
This must also be done with bottoms, hold or cut bow strings. He further cites Jean Frosset's account of the Battle of Crecy, which supports the military origin of bottoms line. When the Genos have felt the arrows piercing through their heads, arms, and breasts, many of them cast down their crossbows and cut their strings and resume discomfited, archers would cut their bowstrings, thus destroying their weapons, in the midst of a retreat so that the enemy could not use their own instruments against him. It is the equivalent of striking artillery, rendering the equipment useless. With this understanding, Bottom's phrase can be interpreted as a military expression for hold your position or give up and retreat. In the context of the play, Bottom is being comically pretentious, saying, be present at the rehearsal or quit the troupe. Notable interpretations. Some of the more successful interpretations of Nick Bottom are those of Samuel Phelps, Herbert Beerbohm Tree, Ralph Richardson, Stuart Wright. Andrew Blake, as well as Paul Rogers. Actors who have played the role on film include Paul Rogers, James Cagney and Kevin Kline. In the BBC television Shakespeare version he is played by Brian Glover. Cultural depictions. Bottom has been the subject of several paintings. German composer Hans Werner Henzer has used Bottom twice as an inspiration. In the second sonata which comprises his royal winter music and in his eighth symphony, 